I would say the big thing is like, I always say progress over perfection, right? You don't need to reorchestrate or reinvent all of your processes make one change that you know will have a positive impact on your customer. And so whether that is trying to figure out the appropriate customer marketing initiative to focus on, that one element of the miles or milestone in the journey that you can switch to proactive engagement versus reactive, or defining a journey at a higher level just to get started. So whatever the case may be, do one thing today that will better your customers. And if you do that every day, at the end of the year, at the end of two years, three years, four years, your program will look very different and will be the journey that you need your customers to have. Hello, and welcome to a whole new episode of Engadi CX. I'm your host, Kimberly, and we are really glad to have all of you join us today. On this show, we talk to CX and technology experts from around the world. We explore, uncover, and share fresh insights on creating experiences that your customers will remember and look forward to. Engati is the world's leading multilingual, no-code digital CX platform available across 14 channels with 45,000 solutions created across 186 countries in every domain and use case. Engati has also been recognized as the top platform by Inc. Magazine, Tech World, CIO Magazine, and many others. We run the Engati blog, the video channel, the Engati CX podcast, receiving upwards of 400,000 visitors annually. And now for our very special guest, we have Christy Falgeroso, a customer success executive with experience in building, scaling, and transforming customer success organizations at hyper-growth B2B SaaS companies. Over the past decade, she's helped many companies redefine customer success, resulting in increased retention, long-term revenue growth, and customer advocacy. She is currently the founder of CS Real Simple, a content experience supporting the simplification of customer success for executives, CS leaders, and CSVs. Welcome to your show, Christy. We are so glad to have you join us today. Oh, I'm thrilled to be here. I'm really excited about our conversation today. But before we dive in into our amazing interview with Christy, don't forget to f- subscribe to Engati and tap the bell icon to get access to exclusive content coming from thought leaders around the globe. Well, Christy, let's dive into our first question we have for you. What, according to you, are the key responsibilities of customer marketing? What do you think customer marketing is essential for in customer success programs? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and customer success can definitely be as broad or or narrow as you need it to be. I'm sorry, the customer marketing function. And I think it a lot of it comes from what your customers need and what the core objectives that you as a company have set forth for them to accomplish. So when I think about customer marketing, the way that I've structured it over my career is I focus on four key elements. Customers, customer marketing supporting advocacy, content creation, sentiment management, and engagement. And so when I think about those four buckets, there's obviously a ton of unique initiatives that you can have them operate. Um, But there's a couple of things that I say to everyone, like if you're thinking about getting started and there's just a core couple things you wanna dip your toe in the water of, I say it's your reference and referral program, having the, the team focus on case studies and success stories, customer appreciation, newsletters, a blog or webinars for unique content, Um, surveys, voice of customer program, net promoter score is a very unique industry aggregate of feedback and sentiment, Um, your customer advisory board, your community and networking events. So that's how I've I've structured my customer marketing web and like some of the key elements and programs that I have that make that up. Like I said, it could go as broad or as narrow as you see fit. I think the thing that's important about customer marketing is to really figure out and and hone in on the objective and what it is that you're trying to achieve, and then make sure that your programs achieve that, and then figuring out the proper mechanisms to drive that in. Yes, I completely agree with what you've said. So what and why do you say that it is hard to switch from a reactive customer success model to a proactive one? Yeah, so when you're you're thinking about most customer success organizations, I feel like the easy way to get them up and running is where you have something that's almost reactive, right? You've got some people that are part of the organization and almost when your customer raises their hand or needs something, you've got somebody who is there to help guide them. But really the best way to approach customer success is proactively. It's to anticipate what your customers will need from you as a partner in advance of that. 
So the way that we've tried to shift that is to figure out what are the elements or the moments in time that you've had to really change and, and kind of make that shift. And it is, it is hard, right? Because you're kind of retraining your team to behave differently. You're retraining your customers to shift gears and how they engage with you. And so it's not only the shift in that change management for the people is also how you operationalize your customer journey and all the different mechanisms that you use to deploy a, an effective program. So what I always tell everybody is if you have the ability to design a customer success function or journey in advance, right, the earlier you do it, the better. It is really hard later down the line when you've decided to deploy a customer success program or team after your kind of customers are used to working with you a certain way or your teams or operations have been built a certain way. So the sooner you can get it deployed, the better off it'll be and the less change you'll have to incur. Yes, yes, you've well said, Christy. Uh, would you like to share a few examples or an, any experience that you've come across which actually helps this? Sure. I mean, I would say that, you know, and following any change management process is probably going to be your best bet because that is really what you're embarking on here. And the same is to be said with even helping your customers adopt your technology, right? You're helping them go through change management. So I would say first thing you need to figure out is what is the core objective of what it is that you're doing, right? Then getting the appropriate buy-in from the teams so that that way they understand why you're making the change you need to. And then I would say like to simplify that entire process is just try to step into it, right? Don't try to change your entire program all at once. Start with, you know, maybe one or two different things you can do differently. So for example, instead of just, you know, kind of going through the journey, maybe say, you know what, we're going to start to be proactive in orchestrating our business review cycle. So this is your proactive engagement with an executive stakeholder, as well as your team to ensure that your customers are achieving the goals that they set out to do. So picking those, those few core milestones and starting to change how you orchestrate those could be a great way on how you shift everything to be proactive in time. Now, again, it could be starting earlier in that journey. So instead of having a kickoff with self-guided onboarding, maybe it is being more prescriptive with how you configure, how you onboard your customers into the, into the partnership. So you've got to really figure out what is the, what are the low, low hanging fruit opportunities for you to go and make that change where it will be complementary to the journey and experience your customers are on today, but then also having that proactive impact where your customers are seeing that you are there as a partner, you are there to help guide and prescribe them along that journey. So um, that's what I would say. I mean, obviously, like I said, it's unique to every organization in terms of what it is you want to focus on, but making sure that you're, you're clear on having that objective making sure that you're getting the buy-in from the teams on what you have to do, when and how, and then figuring out what is the one thing you want to start with and then stepping into your entire program. Changing the whole thing at once won't be effective, it won't be manageable, and it won't be successful. So start small and figure out what are the couple of things you can do to really have a big impact on your customers today. Yes, I completely agree, Christy, because uh, now that we've seen the current situation of COVID as actually forced digital transformation on many companies and there are some companies that are very rigid as to changing their technology but then there I think there there's the gap that comes between your company and your customers and I completely agree with when you said you have to start small start with something that actually helps your customer and then develop yes so uh, along with revenue growth Christy on a complete different note what are mm -hmm. other benefits from upselling customers well, aside from revenue, as you've articulated, you know, one thing that I found to be true is that the more product your customers are consuming, the stickier it is, right? So when if your goal is to keep your customers for a long time and increase the value realization from them, getting them to consume the right products to, to solve the right challenges is going to have that mutual benefit, right? So this is where it's going to help your customers stay longer and grow with you. And I always say, if your customers are not growing, they're dying, right? Like there's only one direction you want your customers to be moving and that's forward. And I think if you set those clear expectations early on, you're going to be able to do that together. So for example, in the partnership kickoff that I orchestrate with any customer that I bring on board, we are very clear in the intention of stating our goal is to help you be very successful with what you've purchased today. Our hope is that if you are successful, that you'll want to stay with us longer and grow with us, right? And that growth can 
be adding additional products. It could be bringing additional users on. The growth really does depend on what that the, your product looks like in your ecosystem. But the idea there is growth, right? It doesn't need to be upsell. It could be expansion. It could be cross-sell. It could be whatever kind of growth strategy your technology and partnership will deploy. But whatever that is, it's being very clear and intentional about that up front, setting those expectations, but knowing that that will help not only grow revenue for the business, but help your customers realize more value, hopefully build better advocates for them, and then also make the product more sticky for them long-term. Yes, completely true, Christy. But what do you think about uh, certain concepts like competition coming in? So how can how can businesses or you could say startups deal with this? I mean, I think it depends on what the competition is coming in and what their angle is, right? If your competitors are coming in and you know it's lower price, right? It's really hard when you don't want to commoditize your software. So I think making sure that your customers are seeing value from your technology and that you've built good, strong relationships will definitely help combat that issue. Um, you know, it's also, you know, are they, do they have product and functionality that you don't offer, right? And can, if your roadmap is not headed that direction, can they use that technology as a complementary service or is it you know, one or the other, figuring out the value, figuring out workarounds. So what I would say when it comes to competition, your best bet is to just make sure that you understand where competitive risk is coming in early. So one of the things that I've done is when you understand that you're operating in a landscape that is very competitive, you've got to ask competitive questions early and often. So one of the things that we've used to do is in our quarterly meetings with our customers, right? And those could be business reviews. It could be, you know, some other executive engagement or mechanism that you have to communicate is ask your customers very directly, right? Is there something that you're seeing in the market that you really like? Is there, is there another solution that you've heard about that you're interested in exploring? Is there something that you feel our product isn't helping you with today that you really need to address, right? It's asking them leading questions. It doesn't have to be as direct as, hey, are you evaluating other competitors, right? You can go softer about it and just understand is what they have with you today solving for their challenges, right? Is it driving value for them? Do they feel like the value is worth what they're investing in it? So if you're understanding all of that, it will help you ask additional probing questions to mitigate that risk. Now, listen, at the end of the day, competition is always going to be there. And I do think that competition is good. It helps everyone grow. It helps everyone innovate. Um, I feel like if there was no competition, you'd probably stay pretty stagnant. So I do think that competition is good. How you navigate it and how you get ahead of it is your best, it's your best offense. So like I said, ask good questions early and often, make sure that you understand the use cases, make sure that you're delivering value and that you've got really strong relationships at all levels. Because I, what I do see happen often with a lot of companies is that competitors don't come in the way you think they will right? Perhaps the company is using a solution in a different part of the organization to solve for one problem. Then all of a sudden somebody uncovers that, oh, this technology also does these five other things. How are we solving for that today? Oh, well, we've got this other point solution in place that's helping us. Well, if we want to reduce our tech stack, right, and bring that down, can we have this one product do all these things for us? But if you're having the right conversations, if you understand what your company's tech stack looks like, if you understand who is responsible and influencing decision-making, you can definitely get ahead of it. But you've got to be really engaged in the partnership, asking good questions, and make sure that you have a good handle on, again, their challenges and how they're using technology to solve that. Yes. You very well put it, uh, Christy. Uh, another thing that just crossed my mind is, uh, I think one of the factors that fuel competition and uh, a complete uh, making the market completely dynamic is personalization. But then uh, I think it kind of puts a pressure as well on companies trying to just personalize their products. What do you have to say about that? Do you see it like a roadblock or is it like a stepping stone? I mean, I wouldn't say that personalization is prohibitive in any way. I also don't think that from an automated standpoint that it's required in order for you to be successful. I do believe that the best partnerships between a vendor and a customer are going to be the relationships you develop where you're, you've got that real connection, right? It's not through automation. I do think that there's a level of human element and engagement that's required to really help navigate that. So when you're thinking about personalization through technology. I think that there's 
obviously a benefit there, but I think that the real personalization that I'm thinking about in terms of the ability to really holistically combat the competitive landscape is going to be, you know, person to person. Yes, that's true. So in the development of voice of customer programs and CX measurement uh, frameworks, is this really beneficial or because I think it's just a buzzword now, but what are the hidden factors here that you think is very essential? To combat what exactly? So help me understand. So uh, we have a lot of, uh, so businesses say that, you know, voice of customers is like your key to businesses, right? So do you think this is actually uh, a thing that businesses should take up or is it just because it's in the market and businesses should randomly take that up? No, that's a great point. So, oops, my, um, I do definitely think that voice of customer programs are super critical because I do think you have to understand how your customer feels about the partnership, what they're saying about you to you and behind your back. Um, and so having a very well-developed and deployed customer voice of customer program is critical, but Again, you've got to you've got to think about how you're going to deploy that. It can be very comprehensive. It can be very labor intensive, and so in order to do it effectively, it takes time and it takes resources. Right? It's not just sending surveys. It's not reading sentiment in support tickets. Right? It's not just looking at reviews. Not just reading or, or hoping that your customers are opting into your referral program. It's all of those things and so much more. So, if you're really talking about a true voice of customer program, it is very comprehensive. And I don't believe that there are too many companies that are embracing it in its entirety. I think there are companies that think that because they've got strong surveys or they are, you know, operationalizing some of the feedback that they hear or they're reading into support tickets that they've that they've got voice of customer addressed. And that's not the reality of it, right? Like I said, it's it's very comprehensive. It's it's being able to hear your customers in all those areas, right? The conversations that they're having directly with their customer success team or with their product team. It's the conversations that they're having with their peers. It's conversations that they're having, you know, um, with your support team and all these elements. So I think again, to have it, I think it's important. I think that very few companies are doing it well. It's very comprehensive and takes time and resources to deploy it effectively. But more importantly than any of the feedback that you're going to collect is what you are prepared to do with it. And I feel like that's where a lot of companies fall short because who cares if you're collecting a thousand different data points from your company, from your customers, right? If you don't have a real way to action that data, it's not going to be to use of your company and your customers are feel like they're submitting or providing feedback in vain, right? Like we're great. I tell you all the time that this is what I need, but you're not doing anything about it. So if you're not prepared to action the data, don't collect it. I think it's, you've put it in a very clear way that, you know, because there are a lot of businesses, they're just collecting data, you know, like just randomly doing online surveys, doing a lot of, um, you know, these measures where you people put in their feedbacks, but then what about this data, right? It's just collecting. And then I think the pressure also comes into is to update the data. Like you've collected some time back and then people have changed because obviously the because market is subject to change. So I think, yes, you've put it very rightly. Um, looks like you are a B2B fan, like we read in your introduction. So mm -hmm. what are the problems and pitfalls of B2B customer journey mapping? How can we identify, rectify, and evaluate them? So journey mapping is a, an organizational initiative, right? So Obviously, there, there are folks that when you say customer journey, they think of once a customer has signed the contract and through the renewal cycle, right? That is one, one part of the journey, right? But the real holistic journey starts from before your customers know that they have a problem, right? Or before they've done anything to address that problem. So it starts with your marketing team. And it goes through your, your SDR or ADR team, goes through sales, it is customer success, it's support, it's onboarding, it's finance, it's legal, it's all of these things, right? So I think the challenge or really where people get it wrong is they try to create the customer journey in a bubble, right? They only think about it through the lens of the, the teams where it's very obvious that they have a direct impact. But the reality of it is there's the things that happen behind the scenes that impact your customer's experience. And then there's the things that you're directly doing to engage your customers. So I would say your biggest, the biggest point of failure on customer journey mapping is creating it in a silo, not including other teams or only thinking about it through one stage lens. And I would say, listen, the opportunity is that 
people need to take a step back, understand the objective of even creating a journey map. It is to ensure that you have a very good understanding of all of the points that will impact your customers, right? Directly or indirectly, manually or automated, right? And then mapping all that out very intentionally to ensure your customers have the journey experience that they need to have in order to drive value, in order to have a good experience. So um, that's how I would think about it at a very high level. Journey mapping is a very comprehensive exercise. Um, It takes a lot of time takes a lot of resources to get it right. It's not something you just throw together on a PowerPoint slide and assume that everyone is then going to do what you want them to do and behave the way you want them to behave. I think there's also the need to also understand, well, okay, if my customers don't do A and they do B, what does C look like, right? So, you know, you've got to, you've got to take into account the fact that just because you want your customers to behave a certain way and do certain things doesn't mean they will. So there's the the ideal journey, but then you also have to anticipate the, well, what if journey? Correct. Yes. I think one of the better ways to add to what you said could be developing personas. I think that could really help businesses. What do you think about it? Persona mapping adds another level of complexity to it. And right, again, every every person is going to behave differently. Um, you know, I, I think for a lot of companies where they're just getting started, overcomplicating it by trying to create a journey for every type of person could be overcomplicating it and making a lot of work for folks. So I do think if you can get there, great. Um, definitely having a different experience by persona is awesome, but you've got to start with just holistically, what is your initial journey look like? And what is that experience at a higher level and then be able to drill that down. Um, But I feel like so many companies fail to do the latter first and do it well that they struggle. So I would say, yes, it's great to do persona mapping if you can get there, but you can't get there until you've got your just ideal journey mapped out. Yes. I think you've, cleared out the the doubt that actually every company just follows. Uh, Thank you for giving us these guidelines and these minor tweaks that can actually help a lot of businesses. So uh, do you want to summarize all of this or is there any other sound bites you would like to leave our audience with? I would say the big thing is like, I always say progress over perfection, right? You don't need to reorchestrate or reinvent all of your processes make one change that you know will have a positive impact on your customer. And so whether that is trying to figure out the appropriate customer marketing initiative to focus on, that one element of the miles or milestone in the journey that you can switch to proactive engagement versus reactive, or defining a journey at a higher level just to get started. So whatever the case may be, do one thing today that will better your customers. And if you do that every day, at the end of the year, at the end of two years, three years, four years, your program will look very different and will be the journey that you need your customers to have. Yes. Thank you so much, Christy. This was, I'm sure, golden words coming from you. Uh, Thank you so much for giving us your time. Your insights were really valuable. And I know the audience is going to enjoy this interview as much as I did. Wonderful. Thank you so much. This is a great conversation today. Uh, We'll be back again with a new episode and a brand new expert soon. So stay tuned and we'll see you around for the next one.